Hi, and welcome to one of the most amazing experiences you're ever going to have in your whole life. I'm Larry. My YouTube handle is Tranya327, and we are here today to talk about the wonderful podcast Enterprise Incidents with Scott Mance and Steve Morris. Every so often, a person or a team or a group manage to create something really unique, very, very special, and it's clearly a case of right people, right place, right time. Enterprise Incidents is so obviously a case of right people, right place, right time that I would actually put it together with the well-known creations with this audience is familiar with Star Trek, Star Wars, and some lesser appreciated ones. I'm thinking of Sam Raimi and the first Spider-Man films, Kenneth Johnson meeting up with Harve Bennett during the first year of Six Million Dollar Man, then the spin-off he created, The Bionic Woman, and the key episodes of The Incredible Hulk with Bixby and Ferrigno, Brad Bird and the team at Pixar during the two Incredibles films, and now Jason Reitman with the film Ghostbusters Afterlife, which I was fortunate enough to catch in theaters a few days ago. I don't really care that what they've put out is not a feature film or a short film or a television series or a miniseries. That's not important. What they've put out is a podcast, and it is a creative work of the very highest order. Their podcast is self-described as a deep dive into the world of Star Trek, the original series, going episode by episode in production order, and they are looking at it from a fresh new perspective with personal recollections and loads of fascinating trivia about how those classic episodes came to be. Now, there are four elements that I can identify that make this podcast the landmark event that it is. The first is passion. If you are going to release a creative work that is this good, then you had better be the sort of people that have this level of love and dedication to their subject. Star Trek, especially the original series, has been a very big part of my life, and I've spent a lot of time living in that world. I am not at the level of a Mike Okuda or Denise Okuda or a Scott Mance, but I am certainly more than the casual observer. And only a person with, I think, this incredibly high level of passion and dedication could have created a podcast that is this good. Now, the second thing is what I call doing the homework. And it's clear to me that Scott and Steve's whole lives have prepared them for this podcast. They have the skill set, and they also have the connections. As one example, how often does it happen that a podcast will bring in the director of an episode of a television show that has not produced new episodes in 55 years? Scott and Steve managed to do that. They brought in Ralph Sinensky, who directed some of the classic, most important episodes of the original series. And incredibly, Ralph Sinensky is still alive, still kicking, sharp as a tack, and had a great deal of meaningful input to comment on uh, during his guest appearances. The podcast is also very well edited, and it's well edited consistently. It's clear that Steve Morris knows a lot about editing and has put a lot of work into editing, and this podcast is a really tight end product, and it shows. The main contribution that Scott and Steve bring is adding context, and context is relational. For instance, how does the episode that they're discussing relate to things that happen or don't happen in other episodes? How do things that these characters say here relate to things that they say in other episodes? What was happening in the world while this particular episode under discussion was being written and shot? 
Here's one stellar example of Scott and Steve looking at an episode with new eyes and causing me to do so too. And this to an episode I've watched for decades and thought I knew all the way to the bottom. In the early first season episode, The Enemy Within, a transporter accident has split Kirk into two beings, Good Kirk and Dark Kirk. While the two halves of Kirk deteriorate, a landing party on the planet below is freezing to death and only a working transporter can save them. At the episode's climax, the two Kirks stand on the transporter pad, ready to be reintegrated into one person again. And before this happens, Kirk looks at Spock and says, Mr. Spock, if this doesn't work, and Spock replies, understood, Captain. Now, Kirk left his sentence unfinished. So what exactly was the unspoken thought being communicated? I've always interpreted Kirk's unspoken message to be, Spock, if this doesn't work, and I come back dead in the way that our involuntary test subject, the space doggy, did, then you, Spock, are in command now. I'm counting on you to step up and to be the guardian of this ship and its crew the way I would have been. Do everything humanly possible to rescue those stranded men, and then continue to look after this ship and its crew and fulfill our primary mission the way I would have. Now that's an entirely straightforward way of reading it. But Scott and Steve suggested, what if Kirk was saying something else entirely? What if Kirk was in fact saying this? Spock, if this doesn't work and I come back somehow alive but in a twisted, deformed, mutilated state, and there's obviously no way to fix it, I am counting on you, Spock, as the only person I trust to do what is necessary to put me out of my misery. Bottom line, I don't care what you have to do, but I'm asking you to do for me what I then cannot do for myself. Put me out of my misery. Now that's an entirely different exchange and casts the Kirk-Spock relationship in a new light. Which message was Kirk sending? That's up to the viewer to decide, but I am truly delighted that Scott and Steve raised this second possibility. And as I said, that's just one example. There are many others. The third thing that makes this podcast work, for me anyway, is I would call luck luck in the sense of common beginnings. Common beginnings between the creators of whatever the work is and at least part of the audience, me in this case. Scott and Steve grew up in America in the 1970s and the 1980s, just as I did. They were first exposed to Star Trek in syndicated reruns daily, and that's the same for me. For me, it would have been WPIX New York. Scott's, Scott Mance's first memory of Star Trek is Mirror, Mirror. And Scott, interestingly enough, my first clear memory of Star Trek is a moment from the episode Mirror, Mirror. It's amazing that you and I have that in common. Also, Scott and Steve are both Jewish and were raised, I am reasonably confident in saying, in a non-Orthodox environment, same as me, which means that American pop culture had a big avenue to enter our lives, and also for us, Judaism, while not being absent exactly, was not at the very center of our lives. It was one experience of many that we had growing up, a bit like what Christians might call church on Sunday. Guys, I saw the fairest of them all, the wonderful sequel to Mirror Mirror put out by Vic Mignona and the wonderful crew at Star Trek Continues. I read the story Mind Sifter as a kid. I bought several of the photo novels as a kid. 
I read a number of the Star Trek novels, went to conventions. Yep, lots of stuff in common. The fourth thing that makes the podcast superior is something that I would call the dog that didn't bark. I suspect that I can correctly guess, or at least have a fair shot at correctly guessing, the political frame because of what they jointly chose not to discuss, or to discuss in a very limited, very controlled way. That's politics. A lot of what makes Star Trek great, great in terms of magnificent, is that it is broad enough to be open to almost everyone. Now, as a contrast, there is a Star Trek fan and commenter on YouTube who released a video during the last three years stating that people who consider themselves conservative in their politics uh, either have no business liking or being involved with Star Trek, or perhaps what he was saying is he doesn't understand how such people have any business liking or being involved with Star Trek because Star Trek supposedly is the complete opposite of everything that this huge part of America is about. Now, I'm not going to name this person, as the point is not to embarrass him. The point is to take issue with his attitude, which I know is widely shared. Really, this huge part of America encompassing tens of millions of people this huge group of people has no business liking or being involved in Star Trek, or if they are, you can't understand it, really. How many politically conservative people have you actually talked with? I don't mean a little five-minute conversation. I mean a consistent engagement with these people as a permanent, ongoing way of life. I think it's a rhetorical question. In my view, there could not be a better, more precise example of how broken our world's politics, our art, our way of life has become than this man's frame, which I know is widely shared, unfortunately. Well, Scott and Steve, thankfully, have taken the exact opposite approach, and thank God they did. Yes, if your life is centered on hatred, yes, it's hard to see how you could like Star Trek. Scott and Steve are fortunate enough to realize that Star Trek's base includes an incredibly huge number of people, people who don't share the same politics. And a podcast that honors the original series would seek to include all of them and not alienate them. And thank God they did. So now we get to the payoff of that which was promised earlier, the crime against Star Trek. So my problem is not with the podcast. The problem is with the reception that it's been getting. The Star Trek audience is huge, or at least it has been up till now. The audience for the podcast appears tiny. I don't actually know if the entire audience is tiny. I am judging it by the number of YouTube views and as judged by the popularity graphic that we can see on the Apple podcasts. I do not know the size of the audience on other platforms, but I would guess that the results there are similar. So the likely current audience is extremely small. That's not okay with me. It's actually offensive to my sense of justice that something so good should be met with such an apparently tiny audience. People do respond to incentives, and the audience is so small that Scott and Steve's motivation is likely not pleasing the audience, but rather an internal motivation of finish what you've begun. Uh, I want there to be more stuff like this. And one of the ways that there can be more stuff like this is if they have a decent audience size. Why so small an audience? The two reasons that I can think of that probably contribute the most are the auditory end product and the duration of the installments. We've all been conditioned 
to have shorter and shorter attention spans. And we've also been conditioned to respond more and more to things that are flashy and to ignore things that are not flashy. Enterprise Incidents as a podcast gives you only the auditory input, and that is all. The podcast is competing with a zillion other things that are maybe not Star Trek related, but which have visual input. And the audience has decided, nah, I'm going for the visuals. That's not a bad development. It's a terrible development. It's not a sign that Scott and Steve should change what they're doing. I don't even know if it has a solution. I'm just describing it. The other thing going on is the duration. Now, their format, their deep dive, their detailed examination, episode by episode, it needs a greater duration, which Scott and Steve give it. But as a general rule, the longer the content, the smaller the number of people willing to be the audience. Now, Scott and Steve know this, and they surely knew it when they began this project. If you shorten the end product to fit into a smaller time frame, then you no longer have a deep dive, or you have a deep dive that's not as good as what you had been doing. So that's not the solution. The only solution I can possibly think of is to break the end product into smaller chunks or chapters. For example, the mirror mirror output could have been broken into three chapters and each chapter posted individually so that each individual chapter would be shorter and thus less intimidating to the would-be audience. I, I have to say that even I, a devoted fan of Star Trek the original series and a devoted fan of this podcast, even I was slightly intimidated when I went over to the mirror, mirror output and saw that the length of the thing was three hours. So again, my unsolicited recommendation would be not to shorten it, but to break it up. The only other thing I can say about finding your natural audience is that if you continue to hit this thing hard enough and long enough, the ice may crack. And I'm hoping that this little review may be a working part of that. So go enjoy this wonderful treasure that you've been provided, Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve, a wonderful output by two very talented and dedicated people, which gets my highest recommendation. And as a final word to both Scott and Steve. It would be an honor to meet him. Let's buy the drink.